Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God. Back with you with the next video in my series reading Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Without further ado, returning to Oliver Twist as read by Lord Naren White. Early on the seventh morning after he had shot, he had left his native place. Oliver limped slowly into the little town of Barnett. The window shutters were closed. The street was empty. Not a soul had awakened to the business of the day. The sun was rising in all its splendid beauty, but the light only served to show the boy his own lonesomeness and desolation as he sat with bleeding feet and covered with dust, upon a doorstep. By degrees, the shutters were open, the window blinds were drawn up, and people began passing to and fro. Some few stopped to gaze at Oliver for a moment or two, or turned round to stare at him as they hurried by. But none relieved him or troubled themselves to inquire how he came there. He had no heart to beg, and there he sat. He had been crouching on the step for some time, wondering at the great number of public houses. Every other house in Barnett was a tavern, large or small, gazing listlessly at the coaches as they passed through and thinking how strange it seemed that they could do, with ease, in a few hours, what it had taken him a whole week of courage and determination beyond his years to accomplish, when he was roused by observing that a boy, who had passed him carelessly some minutes before, had returned, and was now surveying him most earnestly from the opposite side of the way, he took little heed of this at first, but the boy remained in the same attitude of a close observation so long that Oliver raised his head and returned his steady look. Upon this, the boy crossed over and walking close up to Oliver said, Hello, my covey, what's the room? The boy who addressed this inquiry to the young wayfarer was about his own age, but one of the queerest-looking boys that Oliver had even seen. He was a snub-nosed, flat-browed, common-faced boy enough, and as dirty a juvenile as one would wish to see. But he had about him all the airs and manners of a man. He was short of his age, with rather bow legs and little sharp, ugly eyes. His hat was stuck on the top of his head so lightly that it threatened to fall off every moment as and would have done so very often if the wearer had not a knack of every now and then giving his head a sudden twitch which brought it back to its old place again. He wore a man's coat which he reached nearly to his heels. He had turned the cuffs back halfway up his arm, to get his hands out of the sleeves, apparently with the ultimated view of thrusting them into the pockets of his corduroy trousers, for there he kept them. He was, altogether, as roistering and swaggering a young gentleman as ever stood four feet six, or something less, in the bluchers. Hello, my covey. What's the row? said the strange young gentleman to Oliver. I am very hungry and tired, replied Oliver, the tears standing in his eyes as he spoke. I have walked a long way. I have been walking these seven days. Walking for seven days, said the young gentleman. Oh, I see. Beak's order, eh? But, he added, noticing Oliver's look of surprise. I suppose you don't know what a beak is. 
my flash companion. Oliver mildly replied that he always heard a bird's mouth described by the term in question. My eyes, how green, exclaimed, exclaimed the young gentleman. Why a beak's a magistrate. And when you walk by a beak's order, it's not straightforward. But always a going up and never a coming down again. Was you never on the mill? What mill? inquired Oliver. What mill? Why, the mill. The mill, as he takes up so little room, that it'll work inside a stone jug. And always goes better when the wind's low with people. That's when it's high. Echoes, then, they can't get workmen. But come, said the young gentleman. You want grub, and you shall have it. I'm at a low water mark myself. Only one bob and a magpie. But, as far as it goes, it'll fork out and stump. Up with you, on your pins. There, now then. Maurice! Assisting Oliver to rise, the young gentleman took him to an adjacent chandler shop, where he expressed a sufficiency of ready-dressed ham and half a quartern loaf, or, as he exp himself expressed it, a, a fourpenny bran. The ham began being kept clean and preserved from dust by the ingenious expedient of making a hole in the loaf by pulling out a portion of the crumb and stuffing it therein. Taking the bread under his arm, the young gentleman turned into a small public house and led the way to a tap room in the rear of the premises. Here, a pot of beer was brought in by direction of the mysterious youth, and Oliver, falling to, at his new friend's bidding, made a long and hearty meal, during the progress of which the strange boy eyed him from time to time with great attention. Going to London, said the strange boy, when Oliver had at length concluded. Yes. Got any lodgings? No. Money? No. The strange boy whistled and put his arms into his pockets, as far as the big coat sleeves would let them go. Do you live in London? inquired Oliver. Yes, I do, when I'm at home, replied the boy. I suppose you want some place to sleep in tonight, don't you? I do indeed, answered Oliver. I have not slept under a roof since I left the country. Don't fret your eyelids on that score, said the young gentleman. I've got to be in London tonight, and I know a spectable old gentleman as lives there, what'll give you lodgings for nothing. And never ask for the change, that is, if any gentleman he knows introduces you. And he don't know me, oh no. Not in the least, by no means, certainly not. The young gentleman smiled as if to intimate that the latter fragments of discourse were playfully ironical, and finished the beer as he did so. This unexpected offer of shelter was too tempting to be resisted, especially as it was immediately followed up by the assurance that the old gentleman referred to would doubtless provide Oliver with a comfortable place without loss of time. This led to a more friendly and confidential dialogue, from which Oliver discovered that his friend's name was Jack Dawkins, and that he was a peculiar pet and protege of the elderly gentleman before mentioned. Mr. Dawkins' appearance did not say a vast deal in favor of the comforts which his patron's interest obtained for those whom he took under his protection, but as he had a rather flightly and dissolute mode of conversing, and furthermore avowed that among his intimate friends he was better known by the sobriquet of the artful dodger, Oliver concluded that, being of a dissipated and careless turn, 
the moral precepts of his benefactor had hitherto been thrown away upon him. Under this impression, he secretly resolved to cultivate the good opinion of the old gentleman as quickly as possible, and, if he found the dodger incorrig incorrigible, as he had more than half suspected he should, to decline the honor of his father far, far, farther acquaintance. And we'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment, and subscribe, as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care, and thanks again.